Welcome to worship. It is a joy for us to be together today. I have a few announcements before we continue with worship. The first is that uh, today is rally day. So we are thankful for our children, youth, and adults who begin learning today with Sunday school. Our little ones gather each week, little ones and youth, at 9 a.m. On, uh, on each Sunday. So if you missed it today, come back next week at 9, and we'll, we'll have that time of learning and play. And then today after church at 11.15, here in the sanctuary, will be the first of four sessions on the book study of the art of hospitality. So, Pastor Jenny, I haven't had time to read the book, and I forgot it, or I don't have it. Can I still show up? Yes, please come. All are welcome to, um, I'm trying to be especially hospitable for that book class on hospitality. Now, everybody is welcome, uh, whether they've read or not, to participate in that class. Or you can join online at 1.30. One, one o'clock. One, don't be late. Hold on. <clears throat> one o'clock. <laughs> okay. I, wanted, I wasn't sure how much time we gave Pastor Bob to eat lunch. Okay. <laughs> Pastor Bob will lead the class here at 11.15 and then at Zoom at one o'clock. And there's a link in the email, the weekly newsletter, First Glance, from Friday. So if you want to join online, go to that link and we'll gather in that way. So we give thanks for a new uh, season of, of learning for the teachers. And we'll have a prayer for you all in a little while. Two other announcements I want to lift up. You may have noticed in the Nave Lounge, I think it was Carolyn or Anita who were working on a quilt. Uh, they are doing that this month to promote our whatsoever weekly sewing or quilting group. And whether you know how to sew or not, you're welcome. They were back there showing how you can, one of the things they have to do is, is to tie. Uh, and so if you can tie a knot, you can be a part of that fellowship. And they meet Wednesdays, uh, 9 o'clock to 11-ish or later. So join them on Wednesdays. And so far they have 110 quilts to uh, dedicate and to send off to Lutheran World Relief. So there's more information on page 17 about that. So whether you come or not, please keep them in your, in your thoughts and, uh, and prayers. And the, other, the last announcement I want to lift up is on page 18, and that is about uh, our annual mums sale that Cindy Lear will be is coordinating. This is an, an annual fundraiser for Bethany College. So if you'd like some mums, she always gets the most beautiful ones. And, and I'm not just saying that, they're always beautiful, uh, especially for just $7. So please consider supporting Bethany College in that way. There are a few other announcements in your bulletin. Please read through them. And, uh, and continue to pray for our congregation and our community. I invite you to stand as you are able for our confession and forgiveness. <laughs> Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose teaching is life, whose presence is sure, whose love is endless. Amen. Let us confess our sin to the one who welcomes us with an open heart. God, our comforter, like lost sheep, we have gone astray. We gaze upon abundance and see scarcity. We turn our faces away from injustice and oppression. We exploit the earth with our apathy and greed. Free us from our sin, gracious God. Listen when we call out to you for help. Lead us by your love 
to love our neighbors as ourselves. Amen. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. By the gift of grace in Jesus Christ, God makes you righteous. Receive with glad hearts their forgiveness of all your sins. Amen. Let us join in song with hymn number, with hymn, I invite you to turn to page 14 for our gathering hymn. grace of God eternal, the Holy and Living One, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you all.
suffering and rejection, you bring forth our salvation, and by the glory of the cross, you transform our lives. Grant that for the sake of the gospel, we may turn from the lure of evil, take up our cross, and follow your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. I invite you to be seated and please turn to page 15 in your bulletin. We remember today our sister in Christ, Arlene Lindgren, who was born October 9th, 1922, and who entered into the church triumphant on August 31st, 2021. With reverence and affection, we remember before you, O everlasting God, your faithful servant, Arlene. We thank you, dear Lord, for giving her to us to know and to love. And we thank you for receiving her in the arms of your everlasting mercy through the merits of Jesus Christ our Lord. Almighty God, deal graciously, we pray, with those who mourn, that casting all their sorrow on you, they may know the consolation of your love. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us sing together one verse from I Love to Tell the Story. for today is from Isaiah chapter 50 verses 4 through 9. The image of the servant of the Lord is one of the notable motifs in the book of Isaiah. Today's reading describes the mission of the servant whom early Christians associated with Jesus. Like Jesus, the servant does not strike back at his detractors but trusts in God's steadfast love. The Lord God has given me the tongue of a teacher that I may know how to sustain the weary with the word. Morning by morning he wakens, wakens my ear to listen as those who are taught. Lord God has opened my ear and I was not rebellious. I did not turn backward. I gave my back to those who struck me and my cheeks to those who pulled out the beard. I did not hide my face from insult and spitting. The Lord God helps me, therefore I have not been disgraced. Therefore, I have set up my face like flint, and I know that I shall not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who will contend with me? Let us stand up together. Who are my adversaries? Let them confront me. It is the Lord God who helps me. Who will declare me guilty? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please join in reading Psalm 116 responsibly. I love the Lord who has heard my voice and listened to my supplication. The cords of death entangled me. The anguish of the grave came upon me. I came to grief and sorrow. Grant 
Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Our God is full of compassion. Turn again to your rest, O my soul, for the Lord has dealt well with you. I will walk in the presence of the Lord in the land of the living. The second reading is from James chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. This text uses various images to illustrate how damaging and hurtful the way we speak to and about others can be. Not only are we to control our speech, but what we say and how we say it are to reflect our faith. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers and sisters, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For all of us make many mistakes. Anyone who makes no mistakes in speaking is perfect, able to keep the whole body in check with a bridle. If we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we guide their whole bodies. Or look at ships. Though they are so large that it takes strong winds to drive them, yet they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great exploits. How great a forest is set ablaze by a small fire, and the tongue is a fire. The tongue is placed among our members as a world of iniquity. It stains the whole body, sets on fire the cycle of nature, and is itself set on fire by hell. For every species of bird and beast, of reptile and sea creature, can be tamed and has been tamed by the human species. But no one can tame the tongue, a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless the Lord and Father, and with it we curse those who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth comes blessing and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this ought not to be so. Does a spring bring forth from the same opening both fresh and brackish water? Can a fig tree, my brothers and sisters, yield olives or grapevine figs? No more can salt water yield fresh. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the eighth chapter. Glory to you, Lord. This story provides the turning point in Mark's Gospel. Peter is the first human being in the narrative to acknowledge Jesus as the Messiah, but he cannot accept that as the Messiah, Jesus will have to suffer. Moreover, Jesus issues a strong challenge to all by connecting discipleship in the cross. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, and others Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. He asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, You are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly, 
And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, Jesus rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those, of, for those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. This is the Gospel of our Lord. Praise you, Christ. I invite you to be seated and invite the children up for a short message. I have something to give you all today. So come on up and have a seat. Yay! Ben and William and Claire. Hey, you didn't fall this time. Good job. I'm glad you're excited and wanting to get up here, though. Okay. You all are social distancing so well. Okay, let me scooch back here. <laughs> okay. Well, hey, you guys, I just read a Bible story where Jesus says... Take up your cross and follow me. And that is kind of an interesting Bible verse, but I want to talk about the cross. So I want to ask you all to help me, and we've done this before, but look around the sanctuary and see if you can spot any crosses. Yep, there's the big one. Yep. Or maybe... Do you have a, a cross that you really like? You see any around here that are really beautiful? Yeah, I have this one right here. There's a cross, yeah. There's a cross on this candle. You see this cross here? There's a cross on this candle. And guess what? You know what also is on this cross? Nails. Nails have been put into this into this cross. They remind us of Jesus on the cross. Well, the cross has all, we see all different types of crosses, but do you think you have a cross on you or any of you wearing a cross right now? Well, how about this? We're going to make the sign of the cross, and that way each of you have one on you now, okay? So, I want you all to we're going to draw a cross on our bodies, okay? So first take one hand, touch your forehead, like this. Clear. can you touch your forehead? That's okay. Touch your forehead, and then touch your belly button, and then touch your shoulder across the way, and then touch your other shoulder. You just drew a cross on your body. The cross is not just something on candles or something that people wear. It is a part of you because the cross means life. The cross means forgiveness so that when you do something wrong, remember you have a cross that is a part of you. That means Jesus loves you. So when you all were baptized, you all had a cross drawn on your forehead. And you all, well, let's see. Five of you, Lucas, you were, you were baptized in South Carolina, but the rest of you were baptized here at this font. And water was poured over your head, and then you had a cross drawn on you. And that means that Jesus' cross, Jesus' love, is a part of you. Whether you wear a cross on a necklace or whether you have one on your shirt or you put one on your door at home, 
no matter what you all have a cross jesus's love that's part of you okay so we are going to pray together and give thanks for the cross a cross that means life and love okay and how that cross is part of you so let's start we're going to do the sign of the cross first we're going to remind ourselves that the cross is part of who we are so draw the cross your head to your belly button to shoulder to shoulder and then i like to hold my heart after that so i do this and then i hold my heart okay so let's let's pray together okay repeat after me Good morning, God. Good morning, God. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for life. Amen. Amen. All right. I have a cross for you all. Now, I just talked about not just wearing a cross, but when we do, it reminds us of that gift of life and love that Jesus gives to everyone. So I'm going to give you all a cross to wear and to remind you of that gift of jesus so you can pick whatever color you want The, the 2020, our Lenten theme was going to be walking with Jesus to the cross. So the 40 days before Easter, we were going to explore uh, walking with Jesus, and we'd even taped off down here by the font a labyrinth. And a labyrinth is an ancient prayer tool of walking and meditation and i have a few of these i'm going to put in the back but it's a it's a sort of maze and you enter into one side and you walk all the way to the middle and there are no rules when it comes to this prayer practice of walking and reflecting and you can see these labyrinths everywhere we had one at my seminary there are some churches that have them painted in their parking lot uh, people build them with with rocks or or uh, like we did tape them on the church floor sherry peterson gave me a a a finger labyrinth similar to this but it was lovely and quilted where you took your finger and you walked this way to the center and when you when you do a labyrinth like i said there's no rules except that you are to um to try and center yourself in our faith on the cross and so during our lenten season a couple of years ago we had different scripture passages and we invited you to to be in this quiet space and to and to repeat words or or prayers and walk through walk through the the labyrinth now there's something interesting about uh, walking through a labyrinth and walking through a maze whenever we are reflecting sometimes we need guidance but whenever we are walking through a labyrinth 
You know the way to go. You just walk forward and follow, follow the way. And so, like I said, I have a few of these that I'm going to put in the back. And I invite you to grab one and, and have a, a spiritual prayer practice of, of picking a word and following that path and not thinking about anything, but just to follow the path to reflect and, and, and follow the path. Our scripture today has the, the tough saying of Jesus, where Jesus says, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. Follow me. This, uh, this scripture passage comes right at the central part of Mark, where... Uh, the first half of Mark, Jesus has spent exercising demons. He's healed many, many people who are sick. He's been tempted by the devil. He's fed thousands of people. And rumors are spreading about just who this man is. Is he a prophet? Is, is he John the Baptist? Is he Elijah? But it is Peter who correctly identifies Jesus as Messiah, and he's the first to do so. The Messiah was the long-prophesied savior of the, Israel, of, the, of the Israelites, the anointed one. The Messiah was the anointed one, the king of kings, who would bring peace and harmony and abundance to the people of God. This king of peace and abundance and harmony is who Peter is identifying Christ to be. And that seems pretty wonderful to Peter. That is until Jesus begins to explain what the Messiah must do in order to restore peace and harmony and abundant life. In order to do that, the Messiah must undergo, undergo great suffering be hated, be killed, and then be raised. If the disciples didn't fully know what they were signing up for, they do now. To be a disciple of Christ means to follow in the footsteps as of someone, and the footsteps of Jesus would lead them into incredibly difficult places. This following the footsteps of Christ, it wouldn't be smooth, it would be a rough road with potholes and barriers and danger. And so it's no wonder that Peter rebuked Jesus. When Jesus started talking about his suffering, Peter tempted him with the same temptations that the devil said to Jesus in those 40 days in the wilderness. Peter was saying, take the easy road. You're Jesus Christ. You're the son of God. You don't have to do anything you don't want to do. You could have angels fight for you. So it's no wonder that Jesus talks to Peter like he's the devil, saying, get behind me, Satan. Jesus is saying instead, wake up. Deny yourself your selfish wants and desires, especially if they are a roadblock to salvation. Pick up your cross and follow me. At the at the time of Jesus, the cross was a very different symbol than the one we know about today, the one we see adorned with diamonds for jewelry and placed on the tops of buildings. It was the means for someone uh, for the absolute worst type of execution. Crucifixion uh, was meant to humiliate the person. It was meant to cause as much pain as possible in that person's execution. First, people would be flogged, their skin would be, would be broken, then they would be beaten, and then they would be forced to carry the cross that they would eventually die on through the city. And then after being nailed to that cross, if they hadn't died, they would have their legs broken to hurry up their death. Dying on the cross was the worst of the worst kind of death and execution. Cicero, who lived in the time before Jesus, wrote uh, 
wrote these words. He said, to bind a Roman is a crime, to flog him an abomination, to slay him an act of murder, but to crucify him, no fitting word can possibly describe a deed so horrible. He wrote these words about a century before Christ was born. And this is the world that Jesus was born into, one that was filled with horrid public displays of torture. It is that cross that Jesus told his disciples to take up and then to follow. Take up that cross. Acknowledge and understand the pain and, per and persecution and the cost of discipleship. We cannot fully understand that statement. Take up your cross. We cannot reduce it to a joke like, that is just my cross to bear. Take up your cross, but know that you do not take it up alone. During Holy Week, for the past few years, we've had a, on Good Friday, uh, a Stations of the Cross service, where we relive the journey Jesus takes during Holy Week. And we, we read the stories of, of that day, one of them being when Jesus is carrying the cross through, through the town. And Jesus has already been beaten. He's tired and hurt. And as he's carrying the cross, he cannot bear it by himself. And so, Scripture tells us there is a man whose name was Simon. He was from a North African community called Cyrene, which is modern-day Libya. And they call this man to help Jesus carry the cross. Jesus there, in that moment, modeled what surrender looks like by handing that, that cross, that weight, off to someone else. No matter whose problem or issue or burden, we as God's people do not suffer alone, but we lift one another up in compassion and love. There is a, there's a musical called Come From Away. It's one of my favorite, and it tells the story of the town of Gander in Newfoundland. It tells the story of what happened in that town on 9-11-2001. After uh, the, the attacks on uh, our country, all of the airspace in the United States was closed. So all the planes that were flying in had to be diverted out of the United States. And 38 planes were diverted to the small town of Gander, the population of about, about 4,000 people. So in the matter of just a few hours, that community doubled in size. And there were people from those 38 planes from all over the world. And it was a time of chaos especially when they didn't have all of the information. There weren't cell phones like we have today. People were lost and confused, and they didn't understand. Understand what was happening and understand each other. So there's a, a part of the musical, one of the songs tells about, and these are based off of true stories and documents from that time. So there's a, a part of the, of the story where um, they are finally, after more than a day on the plane. It took almost uh, 20, 28 hours, I think, for some people to be, get off of the planes. And so these people are exhausted and tired and dirty and hungry, and they are finally getting a bus out of the airport to who knows where, to churches, to schools, to different community centers. And one of the buses was filled with people who were from Africa who didn't speak the language, and they were afraid. And once they finally get bused to their site, the bus driver tries to get them to come off the bus. And they didn't want to. They didn't know what was happening. They couldn't understand. And the story goes that the bus driver saw one of the women clutching a Bible. He could tell it was a Bible, even though he, didn't, he couldn't understand the language of the Bible. It was written in their native tongue. 
So he grabs the, he, 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 he takes their Bible, and he says, I may not know the words, but I dare say you have the same numbering system. And so he flips through the Bible to the back of the Bible on, uh, and finds Philippians 4, 6. And he takes that and hands it to the woman and says, be anxious for nothing. And then as the song goes, and that's how he started singing, speaking the same language. Be anxious for nothing. Lean on God and trust that God is with you even when we carry difficult burdens, denying ourselves, acknowledging the hurt. Be anxious for nothing. Instead, trust. Trust. Do not doubt your worth. Do not doubt your salvation or God's love and presence with you. Instead, let these truths give you strength in an anxious world. Right after the attacks 20 years ago on September 11th, there was a spike in church attendance. Many different polls across different denominations registered an increase in worship until about November. And then things returned. Worship declined back to where it had been before. One of the, the sayings that accompanies 9-11 is the phrase, never forget. I'm sure you all remember where you were. I do. I was in Mr. Harmon's high school band class. You probably remember other historic events where you were. Never forget. But how quickly did we forget to turn to God, to deny ourselves or the luxury of ignoring the pain, to deny ourselves that, to forget, to bring those hurts to God? Jesus says to the disciples and to us, pick up your cross. The one that is dirty, broken, and filled with pain. Take that up. Deny yourself. Acknowledge the hurt in your life and bring it to God. So Jesus says to us, take up your cross. And I want to say, okay, God, but it's really heavy. My life is weighed down with pain and, and hurt. This last week, one of my seminary classmates died from COVID. He was 38 years old, pastor, and uh, vaccinated. He had been in the ICU for a month and died. Everybody in, that knew him was filled with pain and hurt, and they were filled with frustration and anger and loss. And in that moment, we were forced to embrace our vulnerability, the pain that is around us, to deny ourselves, but to take up our cross, the cross, and then bring all of that hurt to God. I don't know where else to go. I don't know where else to follow, but to the cross. So Jesus says to us, pick up your cross, take up your cross, and follow me. Okay, God, but I still don't know the way. And Jesus says to us, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. I've come so that you may have life and have it abundantly. Because with Christ, the worst things are never the last things. A while back, a woman... Uh, I've shared this with some of you. A woman was walking down, down Fairlawn, and she'd been abandoned. And she came to the church, and when she was talking to me in my office, she said, I didn't know where else to go. I saw the cross, and I came hoping for, for safety and for help. Jesus, the power of Jesus' love, transformed a symbol that represented hurt and torture and gruesome pain, transformed it into something that brings us hope and safety 
and life. Jesus is saying, deny yourself, take up your cross, let me do something amazing for you. Let me transform your pain and your hurt into something of hope and life. Because the worst things are never the last things. That's why that cross doesn't have a dead Jesus. It is empty, but filled with love. Christ has transformed death into life, despair into hope. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we give you thanks for the gift of the cross, the gift of life, and the gift of the resurrection. Bless us all to follow you in the hard ways, in the difficult places, to follow you, to, to lean on you, and to put all of our burdens into your hands. These things we pray in your most holy and precious name. Amen. I'm going to invite our, it's not in the bulletin, but I want to invite our Sunday school teachers to stand up. You don't have to come forward, but if you would, stand up, please. We're going to have a blessing and prayer for you. Adult Sunday school teachers, too. Or adult learning chair people, Joyce. Okay. We give thanks for, for the gift of you all, for giving of yourselves and your time, and sharing your faith with, with our congregation. And so let us say a prayer to bless you and give thanks for you. O God of wisdom, in your goodness you provide faithful teachers for your church. By your Holy Spirit, give them all insight into your holy word, lives that are examples to all of us encouraged to know and do the truth through your son jesus christ our lord amen thank you all and uh, blessings to you this this coming year i invite us now to join in song with hymn number 798 <laughs>
Let us stand as we are able. Together we confess our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of Made children and heirs of God's promise, we pray for the church, the world, and all in need. Revealing God, you have made yourself known through bread and wine, water and word. Continue to nurture your church, that it is a place where your presence is experienced and shared. Lord, in your mercy. Creating God, you brought life into being and called it good. Bring new creation to lands devastated by tornadoes, hurricanes, floods, fires, and other disasters. Restore forests and curb overflowing waters. Lord, in your mercy. Protecting God, you desire all people to live in peace and safety. Provide for all who are in danger. Strengthen first responders to help meet the complex needs of others. Provide care and compassion as they face trauma themselves. We pray especially for Susan, Anne, Alice, Lois, Martha, Laura Martin, Laura Hafke, and Phil, as well as our homebound members, all unable to worship this weekend, and all family, friends, and even enemies we name now, either out loud or in the silence of our hearts. Surround them with your unwavering presence. Lord, in your mercy. Transforming God, you announce release to the captives and freedom to the oppressed. Break chains of discrimination and injustice. Amplify voices that go unheard and inspire us to advocate for those who are overlooked. Lord, in your mercy. Forming God, you gather this community together. Shape our communal life that in our prayer, praise, and worship, we honor you and encourage one another. Keep our disagreements civil and increase our joy in working together. Lord, in your mercy. Redeeming God, you accompany your people through every stage of life. We give you thanks for the saints who now rest in your embrace. Lord, in your mercy. Receive these prayers, O God, and those in our hearts known only to you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Let us, from our pews, share Christ's peace with those around us and with those worshiping with us online.
Stand as you are able. God of abundance. You cause streams to break forth in the desert and manna to rain from the heavens. Accept the gifts you have first given us. Unite them with the offering of our lives to nourish the world you love so dearly. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is the Lord to give the Lord's praise. It is indeed right our duty and our joy that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you almighty and merciful God through our Savior Jesus Christ who on this day overcame death in the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life and so with all the choirs of angels with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, The night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks. He broke it and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again after supper, he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. All who hunger and thirst come, the table is ready. Please be seated.
Please stand as you are able. May this body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Lord of life, in the gift of your body and blood, you turn the crumbs of our faith into a feast of salvation. Send us forth into the world with shouts of joy, bearing witness to the abundance of your love in Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. People of God, you are Christ's body, bringing new life to a suffering world. The Holy Trinity, one God, bless you now and forever. Amen. Let us sing now together hymn number 660. Living Word dwells in you. Thanks. 